video officers club and there was a photography exhibit of Japanese photographers who covered the internment of over 120,000 human beings in the United States in World War II when Japanese and Japanese Americans were interned in this country uh, during World War II. And I just thought about the conference that you're all attending, the Animal Liberation Conference, and the work that animal liberation activists are doing in trying to bring you the images of what's happening behind the scenes. Last night, as the exhibit talked about 120,000 lives, I looked at one of the photographs. It was very shadowy. And it said, at first, camp administrators prohibited photography of fences and guard towers. And so this was a kind of shadowy image. Why would they prevent the photography? Because they understood if people saw their fellow Americans, citizens, non-citizens, residents, behind the barbed wire and the fences, that they would say no. And I think that's what the activism of the animal liberation movement, the part that is focused on bringing what has been in the dark for so long into the light, they are part of a tradition of just trying to go to where the silence is that sadly is often not actually silent. There are squeals of pain, of anguish. It's just that the general public doesn't know about it. And it's when the public does know in a democratic society that change happens. And you know, that's what Pacifica has been doing for 70 years. 70 years ago in 1949, a man named Lou Hill, who was a conscientious objector, came out of the detention camps and said, there's got to be a media outlet that's not run by corporations that profit from war, but run by journalists and artists. And that's how Pacifica was born, as George Gerbner, the late dean of the Annenberg School of Communications at the University of Pennsylvania would say, not run by corporations that have nothing to tell and everything to sell that are raising our children today. And so when we cover war and peace, we're not brought to you by the weapons manufacturers. We're not brought to you by Boeing. We're not brought to you by McDonnell Douglas. And so important to say this right here down the road from where my dear friend and advisor Laura Nader works, right? University of Berkeley, great anthropologist who just lost her granddaughter in the Ethiopian flight because of what Boeing did, That's right. Right? right? Boeing That's right. Corporation, responsible for both the plane crashes in Indonesia as well as in Ethiopia. Samia Stumo, Professor Laura Nader's granddaughter, was going off to work and do nonprofit work first time out of graduate school in Africa and went down in that flight because of Boeing's greed. Right. She, like so many others, and our condolences go out to Laura's family, to Ralph Nader's family. Uh, Samia is the grandniece of Ralph Nader. So when we cover war and peace, we're not brought to you by the weapons manufacturers. When we cover climate change, we're not brought to you by the oil and gas, coal, nuclear industry. When we cover animal liberation and animal rights, we're not brought to you by industrial animal agriculture. It really matters. We believe in showing the images. That's what will save us. So to be here also at the time of Pacifica's 70th anniversary is also an honor. You know, when I was in college, 
I had taken five years off after my second year of college because I thought it shouldn't have to cost so much money just to protest, which is what I was doing every day in school. <laughs> you can actually protest for free. At the time, I was very active on um, getting universities to divest from corporations that profited from apartheid South Africa. Um, and I went off for five years to Maine, to Bar Harbor, Maine, and there we started a whole grain macrobiotic bakery and restaurant collective and um, made thousands of organic whole grain loaves of uh, whole wheat sesame and oatmeal raisin and granola, thousands of pounds and peanut butter cookies and um, oatmeal raisin cookies and distributed them through the bodegas, the grocery stores, the co-ops of Maine. And I thought the coup would be to get organic products to the schools of Bar Harbor. That's what I considered the ultimate. We could not compete with Wonder Bread. They could stay on the shelves for something like two years. <laughs> Our bread would mold after five days. It was fresh. Um, then I decided to go back to school, to use the tools of the establishment to take on the whole food, politics, biology industry. Um, and to disseminate information about food. And when I went back, I started focusing on biology, on nutrition, and I took the basic biology class. So this is my last year of college, and I was really excited, I was very into science. And they said uh, in the class, okay, now you're gonna divide up into your labs, and you'll go up and do your lab labs, and you come back and you have your, you know, your big class bigger than this with the professor. And so I went into the lab, all excited, and you have your lab partners and your lab tables, and they put this large um, jar of frogs on each of the lab tables. You know, I love frogs growing up, as I'm sure everyone did, and, um, and they told us we would each pick our own frog. We each kill a frog. And you know, you'd stick a needle down the spine of the frog and you'd kill it. I was in complete shock. I wanted to take biology because I loved it, because I loved life, and I wanted to understand it. And I said, every one of us in this class, I mean, I'm talking about something the size of this, hundreds of people, we're, in order to pass this class, we have to murder a frog? <laughs> And they said, yes. I said, that's, that's impossible. I said, what about, I mean, you could even do it like, couldn't like every two of us murder, do we, every yeah. one of us yeah. have to murder a frog? What about if just the professor murdered the frog and we all watched? It was the beginning of computers. And I was saying, couldn't you put up some image? Like, and we could learn, why are we even doing this? So the next day, we went to the big class. That was just the tutors, the, you know, right, the graduate students. Um, and the professor said, OK, and lab one, we'll go to Science Center one, lab two, Science Center two, lab three. And, um, and I raised my hand. And I said, and those of you who don't want to murder frogs will stand right here. Woo! And, and we, planning to do this. Um, and the professor said, what's that supposed to mean? I'll see you in my office. So he said, what are you doing? So I said, I, I'm going to ask, what are you doing? Why are we doing this? I mean, I understood I was not going to become a doctor, but this was the big pre-med class, right? This is where all these young people were being initiated into the profession of medicine. This was the beginning. I said, this is the process of desensitization. It starts here. Exactly. Because this is, I mean, we all love frogs. And if you first, you have to really inure yourself to this. You have to sort of close your eyes, but you're supposed to be watching and kill the very thing that you love, that you cherish, that you're in awe of. And that's the beginning of a process. From animals to humans and back again, it's, taking not just the childish wonder and love out of each of us, the awe, but it tells you to 
you suppress these feelings of horror at a very small level, but it meant so much to me at that point. I said, how could we be forced to do this? I said, you know, the whole thing with computers, couldn't you just put it up on a screen? It was really the beginning of that. And he said, all right, you don't have to do it. <laughs> and I went back years later um, to visit. I was giving a talk, and I went into the, the, school, the store, and the bookstore, and they have a, a book that evaluates all the classes. And it talked about bio, I don't know, it's called bio one or bio 101 or bio 100, that was the big class. And I looked at the evaluation of the class and it said at the end, we offer alternatives to pithing flags, the frogs, for those who don't like to kill frogs. Um, and you can do a lab that is, you know, murder free. <laughs> And, but I thought it was so interesting the way it was framed, that the institution had decided that it wanted to offer this alternative. So rarely do they tell you the beginnings of grassroots change, and clearly it took much more than my questioning. Clearly it had gone on for a long time, gotten very big, and so they were forced to offer these labs that didn't engage in gratuitous violence. Um, and that's why Pacifica and Democracy Now!, why it's so important. It's showing you those mechanisms of change that don't start at the top, like when AP changed the language of referring to uh, illegal aliens, right? Uh, they stopped referring to them as aliens, and they announced this. It wasn't a bunch of guys sitting around, you know, getting coffee in the morning before they went to the desk, said, we should stop that. And Democracy Now! we brought you the people who had sat in at the offices for so long saying, stop referring to us as illegal aliens. That's the grassroots change that matters, that we must document, because that's where all change happens. It doesn't happen when the president uh, changes his mind, like President Obama when he went against the Keystone XL after years of grassroots activism. It's recorded as he changed his mind. The question is, who changed his mind? And it was people like you all over this country, people getting arrested, people standing up, people chaining themselves to pipelines. And when it starts affecting the donors to the campaigns, when it starts affecting um, corporate work, then the president understands. But it all started with people like you. And that's what's so critical. That's what gives us hope. Um, I wanted, speaking of giving us hope, talk about a young woman. Um, who is changing the world right now, like so many others, but she is not like anyone else, Greta Thunberg, right? Greta Thunberg. We met her last December in Katowice, Poland, at the Climate Summit. She was 15 years old. How did she uh, bill herself on Twitter? 15-year-old climate activist with Asperger's, that's what she said. And uh, she was there with her dad, Spante, who is an actor, her mother, a very well-known opera singer. And she sort of co-hosted the show for an hour of Democracy Now! that I think it was a Tuesday of the week that we were there. This 15-year-old activist who then told us her story. Um, Greta, I asked her, you know, you talk about having Asperger's, she said, it gives me a very different view on the world. I do see the world in black and white, and I'm very singularly focused. And I talked to her and her father about this. When she was nine, um, she started learning about climate change, and she understood that the future of the planet was threatened. She studied nine, ten, 11 years old, 12 years old, and she stopped talking, she stopped eating, her parents had to stop working to be with her, they understood she would have to be institutionalized, they were gonna lose their daughter, she'd stopped eating. Um, and that's when she said, everyone has to change, you are not taking this seriously. You know, she tells people all over the world, the leaders, I think it was, um, Wednesday night, the next night that we spoke to her, like in the middle of the night, she addressed the UN Climate Summit. We took the video, anyone could have taken it, but 
rarely did people do this, and we just put it online in December. It just went viral, this three-minute talk. Greta Thunberg went on to talk to the uh, European Union, the European Parliament, and she said, you know, you're all acting like children, so let the real children lead. <laughs> and Greta Thunberg, who last September, when she understood what was completely going on, she went and sat in front of the Swedish Parliament for three weeks, and she wouldn't move by herself. And as the parliamentarians went up the steps to go to work, they would say, go to school. And she said, I've done my homework. That's why I'm here. <laughs> and then after the elections there, she started doing, leading a one-day school strike every Friday. And that caught on all over the world. I talked to Magdalena and Rio, um, 10 and 12 year old brother and sister from San Francisco who are leading one of the school strikes here, 10 and 12 years old who took on Senator Feinstein, um, right? And with a whole group of kids and they went up to her office and she got furious at them and said, I've been doing this for 30 years. Who do you think you are? And why should I even listen to you? You don't vote. And um, as one of the 16 year olds said, Yes, but we are, your, we are still your constituents. And Magdalena, who's 10 years old, said, and it's our future. <laughs> I asked her if she had heard of Greta Thunberg, and she said, I love her. <laughs> but how important it is not to have pundits talking about, or even journalists talking about other people, but making sure that People can speak for themselves, describe their own experience. That is what is so critical. That's why Pacifica is so critical. It's why the Klan blew Pacifica up in Houston, Texas, as soon as you know the story. Pacifica's five stations, 1949 your station, KPFA 59 KPFK, it's celebrating 60 years in LA, and WBAI 1960, WPFW in Washington 1977, and, K and KPFT in Houston 1970. It goes on the air. Within a few weeks, the Klan straps dynamite to the base of the transmitter and blows it to smithereen. Uh, when they got back on their feet, rebuilt the transmitter, the clan strapped 15 times the dynamite to the base of the transmitter and blew it up again. And now it took months for them to get back on the air. And then this phoenix rose from the ashes. And in January of 71, they went back on the air and haven't gone off since. And I can't remember if it was the Grand Dragon or the Exalted Cyclops, because I often confuse their titles. <laughs> but he said it was his proudest act because he understood the power of people speaking for themselves. When you hear a child in Yemen or a grandmother in Iraq, when you hear someone who went into a factory where animals are exploited describing what they saw, when you actually hear the squeals of the animals, when you hear this, when you see this, it changes you. And that's what the clan most feared, is coming to put yourselves in another being's uh, shoes, hoofs, feet, um, coming to understand some other person, animal, their suffering. Um, there's nothing that has more power. Uh, you might hear a Palestinian child or an Israeli grandmother says, sounds like my bubba, sounds like my baby. And it makes it much less likely. I'm not saying you're gonna agree with them. How often do we agree with our family members? But it makes you much less likely to want to destroy them. You hear the squeal of an animal, it sounds like my dog, sounds like my cat. Might not exactly sound like. It just makes it much less likely that you'll want to destroy them. And that understanding is the beginning of peace. I think the media can be the greatest force for peace on earth. Instead, all too often, it is wielded as a weapon of war, as a weapon of suffering, and that's why we have to take the media back. So back to Greta and her remarkable journey. Greta, a climate activist extraordinaire, and people taking up her inspiration, especially young people all over the world, 
and she's also a vegan. She changed her own diet when she started eating again, and she told her parents they had to change their diet. She said, you're stealing our generation's future. So her parents changed as well. And she sees that as a critical part of her activism, that you have to live what you feel the change you want to be. So we did this incredible hour with Greta, who was then joined by her father, and then her father got up, and um, uh, Kevin Anderson sat down. Kevin is a leading climate scientist in the world. Like Greta, he won't take planes, so he had taken a train from Manchester to Poland. And um, he takes trains, he takes boats. Uh, and he said to me, I don't want to take up any of her time. I said, you've got all this information. You know, we rarely get to see you in person. He said, yeah, but Greta, this is what's going to change the world. So that was the end of the show. It was in the afternoon. You get it here in the morning. Um, uh, and we got up, and Greta went on to do her work. And we saw in the distance, you have to understand, we're in this convention center in Katowice, Poland. It is, I mean, Poland is already coal land, and this is the heart of coal country. And the convention center was deliberately shaped like a coal mine. It was all black, and it kept descending into the earth. And this matters in the next few minutes as I describe to you what happened next. We saw in the distance Wells Griffith. Wells Griffith was the US representative at the climate summit. And we had just been to his panel. The one panel the US was having was pushing coal, oil, gas, nuclear. That's what they do each year since President Trump called climate change, you know, a Chinese hoax. Um, and yet still goes to the summit to push fossil fuel industry, right? And we go up to Wells Griffith. He's hanging out with people. He's talking to them. And I said, um, can you tell us what you think about President Trump calling climate change a hoax? And he started to run. He started to run. <laughs> and so, I mean, our camera folks, we, they just followed me over. And um, it's a good thing I wear sneakers. And uh, <laughs> I can't remember if he was, but he, and I think he trained at Virginia Mil at VMI, Virginia Military Institute. He literally started to run and we chased him. And I tried to keep up. You can go online and you can see this like seven minutes. I think it was like a half a mile through this descending convention center that was like a coal mine. Everyone was turning around, all the delegates, everything. We were running at full speed. He would run up a set of stairs, realize this set of stairs, because it was sort of modeled on a coal mine, went nowhere. He'd have to come back down towards me. And I would be running. I said, please, you don't have to make this so hard. But what, what is the US doing here? Since Trump said he's pulling out of the Paris Agreement, why are you here? Can you talk about why you're pushing? Push, push. <laughs> and he would run faster, and I would run faster. And, Honey and Dennis and John would run faster. They were holding the cameras. Uh, can you talk about why the U.S. would not welcome the U.N. report saying catastrophic climate change is imminent and the U.S., the world, has to wean itself off coal by 2050? You heard this. They, together with Saudi Arabia, would not um, welcome the U.N. report saying catastrophic climate change is imminent. They would only acknowledge it, right? It's all in the words. Um, I asked him if he could answer the question about whether he agrees again with President Trump, because this was a long run, so I started going through the questions again. <laughs> Can you explain why you're even here? Why did you pull out of the summit? Can you explain why the US joined with Saudi Arabia to water down the language on climate change? And he is now running at full tilt. We are following, we are filming him at every angle. He gets to the US uh, climate um, office he runs in and slams the door. And he says, you should, as he is, because he realizes this probably doesn't look so good. Um, uh, he said, oh, he had said at some point while I was running, why are you harassing me? And I said, a reporter asking you questions is not harassment. And he went behind the door. He said, you should make an appointment. I said, if someone would make an appointment with me to speak, we welcome that. Someone finally came opened the door, was giving their card for us to call, and as I was taking it, pulled it back and shut the door. 
That was my experience with the U.S. climate delegation at the U.N. <laughs> Climate Summit the afternoon we got to talk with Greta Thunberg, right, the remarkable Swedish activist. And I think what the Department of Energy just put out uh, follows in the ludicrous footsteps of Wells Griffith this week. You might have heard it. Um, the Trump administration has branded methane a major source of greenhouse gas emissions driving the global climate crisis as freedom gas. <laughs> they are renaming methane. No, this is not the onion. I am not <laughs> on Saturday Night Live delivering the news, okay? They have rebranded methane as freedom gas. The rebranding came as part of a Department of Energy news release on Tuesday, this week, hailing increased exports from the Freeport liquefied natural gas terminal in Texas. The U.S. Undersecretary of Energy said of the project, quote, increasing export capacity from the Freeport LNG project is critical to spreading freedom gas throughout the world. He was joined by the Assistant Secretary of Fossil Energy, Stephen Winberg, who said, I am pleased that the Department of Energy is doing what it can to promote an efficient regulatory system that allows for molecules of US freedom to be exported to the world. Oh. Methane is now molecules of US freedom. Well, I know those freedom-fighting cows are now celebrating around the world. Um, it would be hilarious if it weren't so serious, if we weren't imperiling the planet. Animal agriculture often overlooked as a source of greenhouse gas emissions, in fact, um, contributing 5% of all human-made CO2 emissions, but more importantly, close to half of the world's emissions on methane and nitrous oxide, two of the most destructive and long-lasting greenhouse gases. How serious this is. We won't be saying methane. Well, you know, we will be at Democracy Now! and Pacifica Radio. Freedom gas? which is also why plant-based diets are so important as they help to combat climate disruption. I wanted to talk about the standoff at Standing Rock. I really am speaking to you today before the panel where we really get into what is um, the animal liberation movement doing today. Um, to talk about what does a sustainable, renewable planet look like. And we cannot talk about that without talking about the indigenous leadership that is taking on the most powerful government on Earth, which, of course, affects the whole planet. I want to talk about the standoff at Standing Rock. And then we will um, have our panel, which I'm really looking forward to um, hearing from and talking to. You know, it was April of 2016, the presidential election year, when it really mattered. This was the year, right, the year that President Trump was elected, where when it came to the general election debates, not one of the, I don't know if you, I don't call them journalists, of the media personalities who ran the presidential debates asked a question about climate change, let alone Standing Rock, about climate change. I was just on a bat panel with Bob Schieffer in New York, right, the CBS, uh, just retired CBS um, host, a long time um, uh, personality there. And he said, okay, maybe we sort of got it wrong. Maybe we should have asked about climate change. But what was happening in North Dakota was astounding. April 1st, 2016, LaDonna Brave Bull Allard, the unofficial historian of the Standing Rock Sioux, opens her property and says, anyone who comes here who is part of the resistance, you can set up your teepee, you can set up here your tent. I open my land along the Cannonball River to the resistance, she says. The resistance, the resistance to the, what they called the black snake, to the Dakota Access Pipeline. 
um, which would snake its way, taking fracked oil from the um, oil fields, the Bakken oil fields of North Dakota through South Dakota, Iowa, um, Illinois, and then hook up with a pipeline to the Gulf of Mexico. And um, the Standing Rock Sioux said no. They actually were not unique. They were like the other North Dakotans. Of Bismarck, the capital, they said no, and their views were respected. Uh, the people of Mandan, North Dakota, where the prison and the courts are, where so many hundreds of Native Americans and their allies have been imprisoned for protest protesting uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline, the people of Mandan said no to the pipeline, and their views were respected. The Native Americans were not so lucky, and they were going to weave this pipeline right next to their land and um, drill it underneath the Missouri River, the longest river in North America. And that's why Standing Rock Sioux were so deeply concerned, afraid it would imperil the water supply of some, oh, 17 million people downstream, native and non-native alike, and they cared. They said, don't call us protesters, call us water protectors. And that's what they did. And, um, we went there late, I and mean, we were covering it from far, Labor Day weekend, 2016. Uh, the team of us went to North Dakota, we landed. It was Labor Day weekend, and we were covering the protests. I mean, they were astounding. You know, people, uh, Native Americans, and indigenous garb, and kids, and uh, men, women, and they would start with a water ceremony in these rural back roads. They would hold up glasses of water. They would be met by the fully militarized rural police departments of North Dakota. They would be met by MRAPs and tanks and drones and automatic weapons. And they would be saying, this is for you, not just for us. This is for your children, not just for our children. They would hold up the water. and. Um, you know that scene of militarized police. You know it, for example, from Ferguson, right? When Michael Brown was gunned down and you had the St. Louis police departments, all the, all the suburban police departments when his body was left to bake in the hot August sun hour after hour after hour after he was killed by a white police officer. There was a whole people's uprising and they were met by this fully militarized police departments from the surrounding areas. And you know, that's recycling in America today. You take the weapons from Iraq and Afghanistan and you give them to the police departments of the United States. Um, this is being protested as well all over the country. As some police chiefs have said, well, how do you think we're gonna view our neighbors when we're looking through the scopes of our automatic weapons? Um, so back to North Dakota, this is what we saw and on Saturday, uh, September 3rd, 2016, we followed a group of Native Americans who were going to plant their tribal flags in an area that they had said was their sacred burial ground. Um, uh, they demanded that the pipeline not be put through here, Energy Transfer Partners, which owns the pipeline, and it was going to be ruled on by a judge in the coming days. And the judge said, okay, prove to me it's your sacred burial ground. So they drew a map, and the judge gave that map to the other side, as judges do, and when the Native Americans got to the site to plant their flags on this Labor Day weekend, they didn't think that energy transfer partners would be digging at the time. They had brought their bulldozers over to the site and were excavating. And the Native Americans felt they weren't, those bulldozers weren't anywhere near that week, that they had used their own map. They had brought these bulldozers from far away to the site to dig it up before the judge ruled to change the facts on the ground. It would be a moot point and they were furious and they came up on the bulldozers and they stood in front of them and women led by women, little girls were standing in front of these earth crushing machines. It was so dangerous. We just kept filming. I could only think back to the invasion of Iraq was what March 19, 2003, three days before in another part of the Middle East, it was Gaza. Rachel Corey standing in front of this caterpillar bulldozer made in the United States used by the Israeli military as she was trying to protect a Palestinian pharmacist's home and she was standing there in an orange construction fluorescent vest to make clear she was there with other solidarity activists and she was crushed to death. She was from Olympia, Washington. She went to Evergreen College. That's what I thought of when I saw these women standing, how dangerous it was. But 
This time, the bulldozers pull back. One, two, three, four, five, six. I mean, the power of the people overwhelmed them, and they were pulling back. And the women and the girls and the boys and the men were marching forward. The bulldozers were pulling back. One, two, three, four, five, six, and they were prevailing. The people, the Standing Rock Sioux, who lived in this whole area. And that's when the Standing Rock Sioux got the that's when the Dakota Access Pipeline guards unleash dogs on the water protectors. Dogs. Now I care for a dog who I love so much, and you could see these dogs. It was a terrifying sight. The guards would throw the dogs at the Native Americans into crowds, and they would bite their way out. This is how they were used. And we were filming, we had showed one dog with his nose and mouth covered in blood. And we we're showing people who were bitten, and, but the people kept marching forward, and ultimately the guards were forced to take the dogs in their pickup trucks and their cars and their vans, and the bulldozers pulled back, and the people at a ridiculously high price, bitten, beat, maced, pepper sprayed, they prevailed that day. And we showed the video we posted this video online. You know, I go on MSNBC and CNN sometimes, and they say, why don't you do more on climate change? They say the executives say people's eyes will glaze over. Well, this showed the lie. That night, we posted this video online. People deeply committed to a sustainable planet. Within, I think it was 24 hours, something like 14 million views. No, I think people care. We went back to New York, we continued to cover this. The judge was gonna rule the following Friday. Um, that Friday, that Thursday, the governor of North Dakota, Governor Dalrymple at the time, called out the National Guard. It did not look good for the tribe. Uh, it did not look good for the Standing Rock Sioux. Uh, the judge would rule the next day. He also issued quietly, um, the authorities issued an arrest warrant for me. I didn't know this at the time. Um, the next day we did our show and Nermeen Sheikh and I headed up to Canada. I, I, I wasn't fleeing. I, it was uh, the Toronto International <laughs> Film Festival. They had done a film on I.F. Stone and they had looked at or news organizations that were following in this muckraker's footsteps and so we were asked to speak after. I wasn't going to go, but I thought we just witnessed this in North Dakota. I should talk about this. And the next day at University of Toronto we were giving a speech to a crowd like this, and I got a text on my phone. Oh, I better finish, because we gotta bring up these luminaries who are up next. But I get a text on the phone in the middle of my talk, and it said, you're under arrest. Oh, oh, and I was like, oh, what? But I didn't want to say anything, because first of all, I thought some scam did someone like in the audience <laughs> just figured out how to hack my phone. But then I saw it was a North Dakota number, and I thought, oh, this could be serious. And you know, and some of you may know, it's not as if, if there's an arrest warrant for you, you're gonna be picked up right away, but you, if you have interaction with the FBI or with the police or with border guards, then you'll be taken in. I thought if I can get over the, I mean, my problem is I'm in Canada, I have to get back over the border to go home. Am I not gonna be allowed to go home? And so if I could beat the arrest warrant to New York, and so I just looked out at the crowd and said, could someone call me a cab? <laughs> And I got in a cab, I raced to the airport, and I did make it home. And there I found, yes, this was true. And I didn't take it personally, the arrest warrant. I really thought that this is a message being sent to all journalists, do not go to North Dakota, which is exactly why we had to go, and especially for young journalists who wanted to go to cover this epic event. I mean, LaDonna Brave Will Allard opened her property, and she said if some people could come, it would be really great. It wasn't dozens, it wasn't hundreds, it was thousands of people. It was the largest unification of Native American tribes from Latin America, First Nations from Canada, the United States, non-Native allies from all over the world. So many resistance camps were set up. People needed to cover this. This was historic. And if young journalists wanted to go and they thought, wait, if I go, I don't have the institutional backing, I can't end up in jail. You know, I wanted to let them know you don't have to get a record when you put things on the record. Yes, it is safe to practice journalism in America, and even if it isn't, we have to make sure that it will be. So we flew back to North Dakota, and um, uh, as it was a few weeks later, as we landed, I, I heard that they had, you know, I was just calling the bluff of these guys. 
Uh, they, we heard that they quashed the warrant and they dropped the charges. Oh, and as we landed, we learned they would bring more serious charges against me. Some of you may be familiar with charges like these. They were charging me with riot, now felony riot. I said, what, look, I'm a one-woman riot? <laughs> and I said to my North Dakota lawyer, not that I had one before, um, well, what's going to happen? And he said, I mean, at worst, a year in jail. I said, a year in jail? And I know some people here face much more than that, and I take this very seriously, and certainly Native Americans did for protesting what was happening. Um, but I said, how much time do I have? And he said, well, you're gonna be arraigned on Monday, like at 1.30, this was Friday. Good, we have two and a half days to cover the protests. We went all over, we covered the protests. We did put out a press release that a judge was going to uh, decide whether, he said, do not say a judge is gonna decide, it's rubber stamp, you will be arraigned. I mean, yes, technically, he sort of signs off. I said, well, then the judge is going to make a decision. I hear judge, I hear he has discretion, because it was a male judge. And so we put out a press release saying he'd be doing this. Well, because a journalist was um, about to face arraignment, it was getting more and more attention. And on that Monday, we decided to do the show. We got a broadcast truck up in front of the Mandan courthouse in jail. They were right next to each other with the Ten Commandments in between. And um, <laughs> we thought, well, I, if I'm right there, I can just turn myself in. So we do the broadcast. I interviewed um, Chairman Dave Orshambel, he was the 45th chairman of the Standing Rock Sioux, you know, like Trump is 45th president of the United States. And I said to him, were you ever arrested? He said, yeah, yeah, charged with low-level misdemeanor because I did engage in civil disobedience. What happened to you? Oh, I was strip searched, I was put in an orange jumpsuit and I was jailed. I interviewed the pediatrician of the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation, Dr. Sarah Jumping Eagle. Were you arrested? Yeah, she was among the first because she cared about the health of the children. What happened to you? I was strip searched, I was put in an orange jumpsuit, and I was jailed. I mean, how much humiliation can a people take? I mean, strip search, put in an orange jumpsuit, orange jumpsuit, it would match if, I mean, if, um, you know, or Shambolt, 45th tribal chairman, <laughs> President Trump, 45th president of the United States. But, I mean, how much humiliation? And um, uh, we did the show. We were about to go across the street. Hundreds of Native Americans came to do ceremonies and show solidarity. And then we got word from North Dakota Public Radio that the judge wasn't going to dare sign off on these charges. But what was interesting is, I mean, all the media, it was the homepage of the BBC, of Al Jazeera, the New York Times is covering us, the Los Angeles Times, Vogue magazine. <laughs> Um, but this is what happens when the media shines a spotlight in the right direction. It wasn't just me that had the charges dropped. Native Americans were facing felony and, um, and misdemeanor charges that day. A number of them had their charges dropped. When the media shines a spotlight in the right direction, this is the kind of reality TV we must support. The kind that shows the reality of people's lives, of animals' lives, of... Um, on the ground and what's happening to them. That's our job in the media. You know, we need to be discussing all of these critical issues. I see the media as a huge kitchen table that stretches across the globe that we all sit around and debate and discuss the most important issues of the day, war and peace, life and death, and anything less than that is a disservice to a democratic society. And I'll just end by saying that and I've told these stories before, but they're just so important and so relevant here. In a moment, we're gonna have a discussion about animal liberation and about the growing movement in this country that's linking up with movements really all over the world. Um, like with the issue of climate change, um, it is so much more advanced in other parts of the world than it is here. Why we need a global media that reflects back and forth the voices of people. We are all in this together. Right, when it comes to climate change, there are no borders. Um, but when I heard last night that Bernard Lafayette had been here, right, the freedom rider of 1961, African-American civil rights leader who came here to talk to people about strategy and what you do. I mean, he and his colleagues who were in college and weren't in college decided to take on segregation of the South and the violence of the South, the established leadership of the civil rights movement at the time said, it is not the time. But they said it is. And they went 
and their buses were set on fire, and they were beaten almost to death, but they took on the hate and the violence. And when I heard that, I just thought I have to end with Rosa Parks. Bernard Lafayette did this in 1961, six years before. You know what happened with Rosa Parks. Of course, everyone does. And in mainstream schools and history books, Rosa Parks' story is told, but not accurately. 1955, December 1st, she sits down on the bus, right? In Montgomery, Alabama, to defy the bus driver who said she could not sit in the white section. And um, she is taken off the bus and she's arrested. And her friend, Joanne Robinson, a teacher, mimeographed, if young people even know that word anymore, thousands of pages that said bus strike. Um, and five days later, December 5th, 1955, the Montgomery Improvement Association has its meeting to choose a leader to lead the bus boycott. They choose a young minister who just moved into town, Dr. Martin Luther King. Rosa Parks helped to launch Dr. Martin Luther King. And they end, you know, segregation of the bus system within a year. But when Rosa Parks died years ago, I was watching CNN, and they said Rosa Parks was a tired seamstress. She was no troublemaker. Oh, that's where they got it wrong. Rosa Parks was a world-class troublemaker. She knew exactly what she was doing. Yes, she was sick and tired but she had been strategizing for years. The media denigrates activists, but what can be more noble than dedicating your life to making the world a better place? Rosa Parks had been to the Highlander Center, right, where black and white together, African Americans, um, Caucasians, people of every stripe gathered to strategize, to challenge segregation in this country. Um, she was the secretary of the local NAACP in Montgomery. She worked under E.D. Nixon. He was a radical labor organizer. He worked with A. Philip Randolph. You know, A. Philip Randolph organized the 1963 March on Washington with Bayard Rustin, who was the black, gay, pacifist activist. It wasn't, you know, the, you know the March on Washington, Dr. King. Life magazine the next week wasn't Dr. King's face. It was Bayard Rustin and A. Philip Randolph's face. They organized this massive march. Edie Nixon worked with A. Philip Randolph to organize the sleeping car porters on the uh, Pullman trains. This was a moment, and Rosa Parks was a critical part of that moment. You know, when you're involved with social change, you build a foundation. You never know when the magic moment will come, but when you build that foundation, you help to determine the future. You make history by being a part of that, and that's what she was a part of. And to show how brave Rosa Parks was, just go back a few months, the summer of 1955, the summer of Emmett Till. She was deeply aware of what had happened to Emmett Till in Money, Mississippi. 14-year-old African-American boy, his mother, Mamie Till, sent him to be with his aunt and uncle to get him out of the city, to get him out of Chicago for the summer. Goes to Money, Mississippi and a white mob rips him out of bed. He was at his aunt and uncle and cousin's house for the summer, and he ends up in the bottom of the Tallahatchie River. He was beaten, he was tortured. When his body was dredged up and sent back to Chicago, his mother, Mamie Till, did something incredibly brave, knowing the worst sorrow of her life that was possible, her only child, her son. She said, I want his casket open for the wake and the funeral. I want the world to see the ravages of racism, the brutality of bigotry. That casket was opened and thousands streamed by and Jet Magazine and other black publications took photographs of his distended, mutilated head. And they were actually published. Mamie Till had something very important to teach the press of today. Show the pictures. Show the images. Can you imagine if we saw those images everywhere? Um, all over the world, when a woman is blown up at a wedding party in Yemen from a US drone, we actually saw her picture at the top of any surviving newspaper above the fold, or the story of a child in Afghanistan the top story of the broadcast, TV, and radio. Or we understood what was happening in these factory farms. You know, 
the animal liberation movement has something that many other movements didn't have, which was people amazingly deeply care about what happens to other living beings. I and mean, one of the most popular videos online, cat and dog videos, everyone loves them, right? That is not the case when you're covering far off conflicts in lands around the world. There's just, there's a deep appreciation. It touches everyone, vegetarian, vegan, or not. It just, we have a deep respect for life. I think it's just in all of us, people are good. But if we saw not only those happy videos, but we saw the videos of horror so we could stop it. I really do think if we saw these images across the planet, you know, Americans are compassionate. We are good. These images touch all of us. Um, and it's the beginning of changing the world. Thank you very much to <laughs>